Hello and welcome back to Char Reads. My name is Charlotte. This guy's name is Huxley. Doesn't really want to be here. I feel like every time I make a video, he's really scruffy. <laughs> I promise he does look nice sometimes. Anyway, um, the last time I made a video on this channel was in May. I was four months into having COVID. And uh, to be honest, I was pretty optimistic. I thought cautiously that I'd be back to work in like maybe two months time. I had steady improvement. I could go on long walks, I could socialize. Um, it, things were looking up, uh, but then June hit and, uh, I got COVID again. And since then, things have been terrible, basically worse than ever. Um, and really, really slow to improve. So it's, uh, it's all been pretty tragic, hasn't it Huxley? Yeah. So in this video, in this little update, uh, I'm going to tell you everything, <laughs> uh, all of my symptoms, how it's been going, medical health I've got, what's going on with work, what's going on in my brain. Um, and yeah, I just feel like I owe it to someone, myself in the future maybe, to get this on video, get this time on my life on video, even though I've definitely been putting this off for quite a while. So I'm gonna put this scruffy boy on the floor and start telling you about how difficult my life is now. And yes, I did put makeup on in this video to feel pretty um, because I feel like I've aged several years in the course of this one year and I don't like it. My symptoms have been pretty similar to what they were before, just worse and enduring. So I've got three main ones and then a smattering of other fun things. Uh, the first one is fatigue and weakness. And I've gotta say, this is the only one that is sort of improving over time. Um, I'm very weak, I'm very fatigued, but in July and August, I was horizontal on the sofa all the time and I'm slowly getting more upright. I can now sit <laughs> for some periods of time and be okay. My partner, Brian, for my birthday in July, um, I think he probably regrets this now, but he bought me a laptop stand, like a bamboo thing that can sit on my lap and uh, has a little tilting bit and a little bit for my mouse. I think he might regret it now because I am such a workaholic that as soon as I got it and as soon as I realized I could do certain things on the computer, that's all I spent my time doing. Uh, but it's good, it's good. I can work on, on my computer now during the day mostly. Um, I've sort of transitioned from being a sofa girl to being day bed girl. Uh, we've swapped offices. So I used to be at the very top of the house, which is very hard to get to. Now I'm uh, just on the first floor in the sort of spare room. So I've got a desk there. I started out by trying to work at the desk. That didn't work out. I could do it for like two hours and then I would pass out for the rest of the day. Um, but I have a day bed there and I sit propped up in the day bed with my little laptop and I'm feeling good about that. I'm also starting to walk the dog, which is nice just to the local park. Um, and yeah, I'm very out of breath very quickly. I can't handle inclines at all, uh, but I'm starting to be able to do that. So that's good. That being said, a problem that I didn't really have first time round is a complete intolerance to standing. I cannot stand up for any period of time at all. It's so pathetic. I can't shower, I just take baths. I have a little stool in the kitchen that I do all of my cooking prep on and I sit there and stir things. I need to be sitting all the time or at the bare minimum leaning on something. <laughs> a few weeks after my second infection, we went to a comedy gig in town. And when we left, I remember just sort of clinging to the walls because we had to walk down the road for our taxi to pick us up. And I was just like clinging to the walls as I walked down the road. And then I saw this woman about my age with her friend just walk by me and she had a walking stick and I was like, yes, please, <laughs> get me one of them. I just hadn't thought of that as being something that could help me at all. And now um, this is my friend. She comes everywhere with me. I've never referred to her as a she before, uh, but it's just a fairly cheap carbon fiber fold up walking stick, ta-da. Uh, although that just springs apart. So usually I just fold it in half, um, but it's, an absolute godsend. It's really transformed my life. It's really up my confidence. When I got it, my walking speed doubled. Um, I used to be very, very slow, and now I'm just quite slow. <laughs> my arms are still also very weak. Um, I can't even like pour a bottle of water one-handed, uh, but having three weak limbs trying to move me forward instead of two weak limbs makes all the difference, and I feel so much steadier. 
and more confident and I just feel really, really good about having one of these. I implore you, if you think that any sort of mobility aid would help you, oh, just do it. I didn't actually have much shame around this and I think that's, not that one ought to be ashamed, but I think there's a lot of shame, even for older people around like having to rely on something like a walking stick or a wheelchair. And I was just like, if it makes my life better, I would really like it in my life, yes, please. One thing that's really great about it that I didn't really anticipate is just how kind people are when you have a walking stick. Everyone's much more cautious, they give you much more space, they make room for you, they stand up for you. Um, it's really, really nice. Just before my second infection, I was flying to Barcelona, uh, where I got COVID, and um, I was really scared of flying because I was gonna be alone um, because Brian, my partner, was already out there. He was gonna meet me at the airport and everything, and I got a taxi to the airport from here, but I was just like really afraid of traveling. Everything was absolutely fine until passport control, where <laughs> there was like the EU queue, which was really short, and then there were all of these Brits queuing for like, all other passports. And I was like, it's okay, I'll be okay. I was there with my little wheelie suitcase. Um, and then 10 minutes passed and we barely made it down this queue. We were maybe like 10% through the queue. It was a really, really long queue. And I was like, I'm going to pass out. Like I cannot, I can't stand for this long. And like my tolerance for standing then was much better than it is now. But uh, I was like, I can't, I just feel myself going and I need to, just skip this queue. Um, so I got out and went to the back and went to this uh, this man surrounded by his colleagues and was like, hi, I have severe fatigue. I have long COVID. I can't stand in this queue for this long. Um, it's like, what else can I do? And he was like, everyone's tired. Everyone's got to stand in the queue. And I was like, no, I, I will fall over. And he was like, I'm sorry, there's nothing I could do. And I was like, that's ridiculous. I was like, I need to be sitting down. I can't queue for that long. And he was like, what do you want me to do? And I was like, well, can you get me a wheelchair? And he literally like laughed at me and his colleagues laughed. And it was one of those things where I'd already gotten myself out of the queue. Then if I rejoined at the back, it would have taken even longer. And I was like, no, I really stick my feet about this because I can't do this. Um, and I just kept insisting that I couldn't queue for that long and um, he eventually went to talk to somebody and then uh, I got to go in the, the EU queue which had like two people in it by that point and then I got out and I lay down on the floor of the airport <laughs> in arrivals waiting for my boyfriend to get to me like I was really wiped by then um, but if I'd had a walking stick do you think that man would have been like laughing me off no he would not <laughs> Uh, anyway, sorry, that's just one of the many annoying stories I'm going to tell today. Um, but yeah, absolutely love this. On the topic of airports, I have been on one trip since, one like international trip since um, to Budapest. And I used special assistance in the airport because I was really, again, afraid of traveling and I was a lot worse by then. So special assistance, anyone can book it. Um, you just have to tell the airline 48 hours in advance and you can do it for any reason. You don't even have to explain. Um, you just have to tell them like whether you're able to get up the stairs onto the aircraft yourself and whether you're able to get into your seat yourself. The majority of people that use airport assistance are not full-time wheelchair users. They're ambulatory wheelchair users or they've just broken their leg or you know something like that. Um, and it was phenomenal. <laughs> I checked in at Gatwick, they just put me in a wheelchair, zip you through security, like with Brian with me, went down a secret corridor to get like past all of the duty-free stuff without having to go through it. Um, and then we got to this assistance area and they gave me a buzzer and they were like, okay, be back here in half an hour or when your buzzer goes off and we'll just put you in another wheelchair, we'll put you in a buggy, we'll take you to the place and then you get to be first on the plane. And you do have to be at the back of the plane. This is one of the... I don't know why, I, I don't know why, but anyway, people with assistance go at the back of the planes. It was incredible. <laughs> I felt so well taken care of and it just completely took out any, any like physical energy that I had to put in. And you get off the plane at the other end, someone's waiting there with a wheelchair for you. It's brilliant. Again, would, if you are low mobility or even if you like break your ankle one time, would super, super recommend um, assistance in the airport. I will be taking that 
for as long as I need it. Anyway, from that happy tale, let's move on to my paralytic episodes. Uh, so um, I sort of glossed over this in my last video uh, because my doctor glossed over it, um, but this is still a really big problem in my life. <laughs> so having spoken to more doctors about this and, and read up on it more, um, it doesn't seem to be very common, but it does seem to be just like a form of extreme fatigue. So my body will completely run out of energy, very quick onset, but also like fairly short periods of time as well. It ranges from me needing to just like lie down flat for five minutes to being completely comatose, can't move any of my body parts, lying there cross-eyed because being cross-eyed for some reason when I'm in that state is more comfortable than having my eyes closed or looking at something. <laughs> and that can last for like an hour, and if I just feel really, really sick, they often need to be slept off. So that's just like a two hour nap afterwards. And then when I wake up from that, I again feel shit because I feel awful whenever I wake up from any sleep. Uh, but then after sort of like 15 minutes, I'll be back to my normal self. This is the thing I would say that's affecting my independence the most. Um, so one weekend, I think it was in August, uh, Brian was away for the weekend and I had to fend for myself and take care of the dog, but thankfully, we had friends in town that were gonna take care of the dog a bit for the, over the weekend. Anyway, so Friday morning, Brian's gone. I take the dog to the park, have a great time in the park. First time I've taken him to the park on my own in months um, and came back and was like, great, I feel really good. I need to go to the pharmacy today to pick up a prescription because I've run out of one of my prescriptions. I may as well just do that now because I'm feeling good. So I walk the five minutes to the pharmacy, pick up my prescription really easily and then I start walking back and a minute into walking back, I start to feel it. And the way this <laughs> occurs to me when I'm walking along and this this like fatigue episode sets in is that my legs just decide to stop moving. Like I start walking really, really slowly and really, really little bits. And then eventually I just have to stop. Um, and usually at that point I would lie down. <laughs> uh, but I was like, I'm on my own on a random street. Uh, my partner's not around and at that point in time I didn't have like close enough friends living nearby to be like come help me um, uh, and I, I was like I've just got to make it home and it's literally like dra dragging my feet two inches forward I couldn't even like move my arms to get my phone out of my pocket to ring anybody I was like just zombie girl and I had my walking stick at that point like I still I still had his assistance um with my balance and stuff but I just like nothing in my body was working and I was like it's okay it's just gonna take a really long time to get home it's gonna take what would usually take a normal person four minutes and would usually take me eight minutes is gonna take half an hour and we just have to live with that I got a, a minute down the road and I was like Charlotte this is one of these times that we collapse and we need to ask for help uh, and I literally flagged down a car that was driving by. <laughs> I was like, please, can you give me a left home? Um, thankfully it was a couple, they were really, really kind. Uh, and they, they gave me a lift home. And you know, I explained my situation stuff and I got home and I just sobbed. I was such a wreck. And since then we've basically been like, I'm not allowed to go out alone um, because this can happen anytime, anywhere for no reason. Uh, it's making me quite emotional just talking about it because it's so horrible. I have like a better idea now of what sort of level of exertion will cause one of these episodes. And sometimes I kind of like will chance it because I want to do something exciting. Um, but I cannot think of a nice plan I've had since June or even before then that hasn't been tainted by me collapsing at some point, um, which is really, really, <laughs> really upsetting and sad, isn't it? <laughs> Literally last night, it was our five year anniversary. Uh, we went to the Panto because Ian McKellen was in it and we just thought it would be good fun. And it was good fun. I even made it to the upper circle. I pulled myself up two flights of stairs and had a really good show. It was really good fun. And then at the end of the Panto, when everyone was clapping, I wasn't standing up. There were like a, quite a few bits where people had to stand up. I wasn't going to do any of that. I accepted that from the start, but I was clapping. And then after a while I was like, wow, clapping feels really tiring. I'm just going to like stop clapping. And I just like dropped my hands on my lap. And then I was like, oh no. And a minute later, I, the clapping was <laughs> still going on. I was like, 
I just sit there with my mouth open. I don't know why my mouth has to be open when this happens. It just does, I guess it's less effort, less energy for my body to use up, but like can't move my arms, can't move my body, can always move my eyes, that's fun. Um, <laughs> and thankfully, I, will, I never worry about not being able to breathe in these scenarios. Like the rest, my body still functions, which is nice. Um, but I was just like, I can't do anything. And Brian just had to, like he noticed when everyone started leaving, you know, I wasn't even like replying to his, I couldn't even like look towards him. He was like, it's okay, honey, we'll just wait. But like five minutes later, the whole theater had emptied out. And um, at that point I was like, I still really don't feel like I can move my arms. But I, like, I know in all these cases I can, it's just gonna use up like all of my energy. And like, as soon as I start moving again, it gets a bit easier. Um, but it's like that initial thing of like, it's like using your whole body to just hold up one hand. <laughs> it's, it's a really strange feeling. Um, anyway, we were gonna go out for dinner and drinks um, we just went home because I collapsed and that is the story of so many times <laughs> and that's not like a particularly bad one you know it didn't last that long it wasn't like that visible or embarrassing I've had I've been like lying alone prostrate in a field before and having like loads of random people stand around me and stare at me like that was pretty bad maybe one of the worst was when I was in Budapest and um, the one trip I didn't I just couldn't let myself give up this year because we were going to see the Hungarian Grand Prix, which I was really excited about and it was so much fun. Um, and I made it through the whole weekend uh, without having any problems. We got taxis literally everywhere and I was being very strict on limiting what I did. Um, and we, we went to the race, we had a really, really good time at the race and we were walking to the taxi rank, which was the other side of the circuit. Normally a really fun far away, but I did it the previous day and I was okay. Um, and good old walking stick girl gets to skip to the front of the taxi queue. Um, if I didn't have a walking stick, I would probably not be able to convince them that I, <laughs> that's a requirement for me. Uh, but yeah, halfway, halfway back to the taxi rank, feel my legs start going. And I'm like, oh no. And really annoyingly, there was, there was an ambulance right there. There were medics right there. And I think about it every, day or so <laughs> just being like why didn't I just say to them I need to be taken to the taxi rank because I'm about to collapse it's so I'm, it makes me really it's because I angry at myself but like I don't have anything to be embarrassed of or like I didn't let myself down it's just it's really hard to ask for help in these scenarios and I'm getting better at it I'm, I think I'm really good at it now but I just should have called it earlier. But yeah, we I still had ages to go. My friends were ahead of us and they came back and they were like, do you want, we could like lift you and carry the way down. And I was like, no, I'm going to walk myself. Um, and I had my walking stick and I was like, I was like two hands on the walking stick, like pointing down, like pulling myself forward because my legs didn't want to move. My arms were a little bit better. And then we got like almost there. We had to stop for some cars passing. I got so, I fell over on a bank to rest. I was like, in my mind, I was like, oh, I can just lie. I could just lie there for like five seconds while we're waiting. And to everyone else, they were like, wow, she's really, she's done for. Um, anyway, had to be carried into the taxi. Uh, couldn't move or speak for that half hour taxi ride. Had to be like mostly carried up back into our Airbnb. And then I had to lie in the dark in the Airbnb for two days, just recovering because I felt so shit. So uh, that's a traumatic one. <laughs> There have been a lot. <laughs> it's also just very regular. Like this is now something that happens basically every time I go out, and which wasn't the case before June. Uh, I've yeah, had a roast at the pub on this road and had to walk myself home early because I started feeling bad. Same with the cafe down the street. Same with like another pub an eight minute walk away, which we even drove to because I this had happened before. Um, and I was like, sorry, can we leave now? I need to leave now. <sighs> anyway, um, that's a bad one. It's really difficult because I feel very unsafe being anywhere unfamiliar and being without people that like know me well and know how to take care of me in the scenario, which is basically only Brian. Um, at this point, I think all of my friends have seen me in that state, <laughs> but they wouldn't know how to actually like what to say and when to move me and, and what to do. It's really lame not being able to go anywhere on my own, really. Anyway, let's move on. Okay, my third main issue is my vision. 
Um, this is, is really hard to tell if it's improved, but I think, I think it probably hasn't. When I'm having a particularly like fatigued day, um, it feels worse. Uh, but yeah, still cannot read. The problem I have is processing visual information. Um, so for example, I'm fine watching YouTube on my phone. It's much more comfortable for me than watching YouTube on my laptop screen because it's just taking up a smaller field of my vision and it's easier for my brain to handle that. And words, words are a lot for the brain to handle. Even like complex patterns, lots of color, lots of shapes, like make my brain explode. So words are really difficult. Books are out of the question. Menus are often quite difficult. <laughs> I have to get them read out to me. But there are some things that are better. So white text on a black background um, is just so much less exhausting than the other way around. I don't know why, but it's kind of okay for me to use my computer on dark mode. But as soon as I look at a website that's like, or like a PDF or something, it's just horrible. I also tried using my Kindle on inverted mode and um, I could read a few pages, but it still felt like re really quite taxing. The problem is, is that I can look at the thing in the middle fine, um, but my brain it just struggles to interpret the area around that. And the longer I try, the harder it gets, and it gets really headachey and really frazzled. And um, like, if I've just been trying too hard and overdo it with trying to read something, I just have to like lie down and listen to a podcast for a while because I just need a break from that part of my brain working. This also means I can't really drive. Um, so I've driven a handful of times that it doesn't like hurt my brain to do it. It's just about okay to do it, but it just feels extremely dangerous because I just, I don't understand what's going on in my peripheral vision. Like my brain is not good at like assessing threats and dangers and things I need to be aware of like pedestrians. Um, so yeah, self-imposed, not allowed to drive. Um, I did drive at night once and that was a lot easier. Um, I think just way less stimulation, that was a lot easier, but still I don't think I could handle it for extended periods of time. So not good, I would say, generally, the whole vision thing. Um, but this is one area where I'm getting some medical attention and hopefully the tides will change soon. So we'll tackle that in a separate section. So those are my three main symptoms. Um, the other thing, that I experience a lot is just general malaise and that comes with a bunch of other little symptoms. I can feel my legs all the time and they hurt all the time. So I have enduring leg pain. Um, I get dizzy. Uh, I have quite a lot of light and sound sensitivity. These are things that are happening less often, I would say. There's no rhyme or reason for them. Um, and I, but I definitely feel like when I first got sick, both times I would be on the sofa and like the majority of my day would just be like dealing with feeling rubbish. Um, and now that is like a rarer thing for me to have to deal with. When I'm, for example, having one of those episodes um, that can come along with like all of these things and feeling terrible and like the aftermath of one of them can be very much like full of this malaise. I did think I'd escape this entirely. And then last week I had one day where I just felt so bad I couldn't get out of bed at all. Um, again, no trigger. So it's, it's always a fun roll of the dice every day. Um, but yeah, those are, that covers it from the symptoms perspective. Next, let's talk about the medical assistance I have received um, when I made that video in May. Basically nothing. I basically got nothing. Um, now a lot of things have moved along, so that's nice. Um, I'm part of the long COVID clinic um, in my county or like NHS trust area or whatever. Uh, and they phone me up every three months to check in on how I'm doing. And they recommend things that either my GP can pursue or they have like specialisms within them that they can refer you to various things. And the summary of that is that it's been a lot of like, hope of things that might happen and then they don't actually work out. Um, so I was put forward for this English National Opera Breathe program, which is all about using like operatic techniques to improve your breathing. Um, got to the front of the wait list for that, uh, had my kind of intake call with them. And they, at that point, I just couldn't really even sit up without it exhausting me for the day. Um, and they, they were like, we have to consult with our clinicians of whether this is suitable for you. And they, they basically said, 
we think that it will negatively affect your recovery in terms of your fatigue. So no, for now. Uh, pay. Uh, the other thing is that I was supposed to have a meeting with a fatigue specialist um, as part of the clinic thing and they rescheduled twice. It was supposed to be rescheduled. Um, it never was basically and I'm trying to chase them up um, sort of waiting for them to ring me. I keep missing calls, but then I can't call them back and who knows, maybe that will happen someday. They also referred me to the Brighton Wellbeing Service, uh, which is like frontline mental health support. Um, and through that, I got a eight week course of CBT, which was mostly around pacing and goal setting. And we spent most of the time doing assessment tests, the GAD7 and the PQH9. And apparently I was the first person that this counselor had ever spoken to that like wanted to record the answers of them over time. And uh, yeah, basically I'm mildly to moderately depressed and mild to moderate anxiety uh, fairly consistently. It hasn't gotten better. I did enjoy those sessions, but they really didn't actually suit the progress of my illness in terms of goal setting. He would be like, you know, why don't you read one page a day? And you know, after two weeks, you can up it to two pages a day. And it's like, I'm not gonna do that. None of the physical symptoms I have can be improved by just doing the thing more. Like they can't. Um, and how unsatisfied, to tell someone that used to read two books a week to read one page a day, that would be the least satisfying thing. It just would drive me absolutely nuts. And he was also like, you know, with the fatigue, you need to do, you know, do a five minute walk every single day and then up it to a six minute walk after a week. And I just can't be that regimented. It would drive me nuts because I am up and down. And when I'm up, I want to take advantage of being up. <laughs> and when I'm down, I'm not gonna force myself to go outside. Um, so yeah, that wasn't, it wasn't very useful. And also I kind of came into it being like, I would like some mental health support because I feel like my identity has been shattered because I was a workaholic and now I can't do anything. And I was, you know, worried about money and worried about like what my life would look like. And the CBT did not want to go into those areas at all. So that's over, it was fine. Uh, but I now have a private therapist um, and we've only done like three or four sessions and I'm really liking the time I'm spending with her. Um, so that's, great and I feel like I have the mental health support I need. Still haven't really answered those questions about what my identity is now <laughs> or like really how I feel in the long term but day to day I'm doing okay. So moving on to my GP. Um, I have on the books the GP that is my name GP I don't get along with like I find him really dismissive. We've met like a few times throughout this process and he is not been helpful. He was a person that said that maybe my paralysis was caused by anxiety. Anyway, but I found a GP within the GP practice who I really like and is now like my champion. So we've been doing more work together. I saw her this morning, which is exciting. Um, so she in July, I think, maybe it's August, um, recommended I start on SSRIs, so antidepressants. Um, not for depression, because I, I'm not depressed, um, but she'd seen a lot of um, ME CFS patients have their fatigue improved on SSRIs. And I was like, I'll try anything at this point because no one's given me anything. <laughs> so yes, please. Uh, so I've been on sertraline um, since then. I think I was on 50 milligrams a day and I'm now on 100 milligrams a day. We upped it to see if it would make a difference. It hasn't. That when I spoke to her like a month ago, I was like, should I keep going with this? And she was like, well, really your choice. She was like, there's no harm in, in keeping going with it. And I was like, while things still feel very up in the air, I'd sort of rather wait until I feel a bit more stable because who knows, maybe my mental health is <laughs> actually, you know, maybe, maybe if I went off my antidepressants, I would be depressed. I don't know, maybe, who knows? It didn't feel like they were doing anything at all. They definitely didn't do anything for my fatigue, uh, but I'm now worried that maybe I actually rely on them <laughs> to be this chirpy. Anyway, the other thing, uh, we just today um, did a POTS assessment. So POTS stands for Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome, which is all to do with your autonomic system. So that is the parts of your body that do things without you having to think about them. So breathing, blood pressure, heart rate, etc. 
Um, I now officially have POTS, uh, which is something I sort of suspected but didn't think was a big deal for me. I think what it means in terms of long COVID is that my capillaries aren't um, doing their job when I lie down or stand up. And so when I'm in different postures, my heart has to like overcompensate for other parts of my body not doing the things right. Um, this is something that's really common in long COVID. I didn't think it was actually a problem for me because I haven't really had problems with my heart throughout all this. So I didn't think this would really be a big problem for me, but now that we've officially given it to me, oh, my doctor is literally ringing me. I should, I should answer that. Hello? Is that Miss Anne? Yes, it is, hi. And she would like to get you booked in for an ECG. Bye. Very relevant to what I was saying, and now I need to go back to the notes on my phone. Yes, I have POTS. I didn't think it would really be, a, like, a, I was like, it's something to do with the heart, and my heart seems to be fine. Um, but then my doctor was like, well, let's find some medication for you for this, and then it could actually solve a lot of your fatigue problems, because it's all connected. Um, so for the first time ever, I might actually have a treatment path for fatigue. So today she referred me to cardiology because uh, she was like, well, it would just be me stabbing the dark at, at, at um, medication for this. <laughs> so let's get you with the specialist that presumably actually has quite a lot of long COVID patients. And um, yeah, so that's the next step. I just on the phone booked in an ECG. Um, I actually have had one before, but it hasn't, the information hasn't got to them. So. That's moving along and I feel good about it. And now we come to the exciting one, which is the vision issues, medical stuff. Um, I was really concerned about this because this was the thing that was massively affecting uh, my quality of life. So I, with the doctor, I was like, can we do something about this? And she said, referrals to neurology, honestly, they have a year long waiting list. So I don't think it's worth me doing that. And I was like, but I want it to be fixed. <laughs> um, and she was like, okay, what I can do, which may work, is I can send them a letter asking for advice in your case and be like, if you wanna see her in clinic. Um, so my lovely doctor did that. I'd seen on like long COVID Facebook groups and stuff I'm now a part of, um, I'd seen that a lot of people with, for example, memory issues, uh, they through practice have, have, have seen massive improvement. Um, and that has, that, that's been like information that neurologists have given to them. So I was like, neurology can help fix my eyes somehow. She sent that letter off in June or July, a uh, long time ago. And we got a reply saying, we can't offer any advice, but we would be interested in seeing her in clinic. And I got an appointment for September. Um, so it was still a bit of a wait, but wow, I was like blown away. Um, so I saw this, I'm still excited just thinking about it. <laughs> I saw this registrar um, in the hospital and they went through like a bunch of different like tests for my brain. And she was like, it's very strange that this is the only cognitive issue you have. Like I don't have any other cognitive issues. It's just visual processing. And she was like, it's probably just a weird long COVID thing because there's lots of weird things about long COVID. Uh, but I'd also like to get an MRI for you. Um, just to see if we can see anything. She was like, probably won't show anything, but um, yeah, I, I would like to check. And I was like, okay, but like, if it did show something, what might that thing be? <laughs> and she was like, okay, well, you could have a blood clot in your brain near the area that handles visual processing, uh, or just like inflammation in that area could be the cause of this, um, which, would mean I have had a stroke and that scared the living daylights out of me because to me, a stroke, you can improve after a stroke, but it tends to, as far as I know, your improvements happen quite quickly. And if you don't improve, you're sort of stuck at that level like forever. And the idea that I could never read again, not cool. Anyway, um, she also said that her con the consultant, neurologist consultant in the hospital runs a neurology co long COVID clinic and that she would refer me to that. And I was like, 
amazing <laughs> because that would that's exactly what I need. So it's a neurologist that has had a lot of long COVID operations. So she referred me to that. It was with a neurologist called Dr. Chan and I was really hyped. And uh, like a couple weeks later, I got an appointment date with Dr. Chan. And uh, then I got a phone call from the registrar being like, hey, discussed your case with Dr. Chan. He thinks that you're not suitable for his long COVID clinic because your symptoms just don't match any of his existing patients. Uh, and I was gutted. <laughs> I was like, this is the one thing I want to do. And, and she was like, but we would really like to do the MRI. And I was like, fine. But I was also like, I had this appointment with him. Should I cancel it? And she was like, ah, you're, you're cool. Um, and, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, when I asked her, are there exercises I can do to help? Um, she was like, no, not at all, because the problem is overstimulation. Like you're already overstimulating. It's not like you're underdoing something and it could then build it up. Like your daily living is too much for your brain. Um, so that was a bummer to hear. But anyway, uh, so I had this appointment still with Dr. Chan and I was like, I'll go to it. Like it might not turn into anything. It might be a waste of a morning. Uh, but I'll go. And it was the best doctor's appointment I've ever had in my life because I went in, he knew my whole case. He knew, he was like, MRI said they haven't got this information from you. And I was like, oh, I sent it to them. And he was like, well, I, okay, I'll follow up on that. And what about this, uh, this fatigue specialist you're supposed to be seeing? And I was like, long COVID clinic, haven't gone in touch with me. And he was like, I'll get onto them about that. Amazing. Um, I mean, I'm sure like all of his, people were doing secretaries <laughs> doing that work rather than him but just I felt very well taken care of and he was like I think I can help I think it's a gain of function and a lot of the long covid um symptoms I've been seeing a gain of functions rather than loss of function so for example I have sensation in my legs like new sensation rather than for example numbing it's a gain of function which is a mechanism in the brain that we can treat with a variety of different drugs so he said the one that he wanted to try out on me um, is this drug called carbamazepine and it's for people with epilepsy because epilepsy apparently like is also a problem with sort of overstimulation in certain areas of the brain um and i was like amazing and i was like when when if this did work when how would i know when when would i find out and he would be like you'd be fixed in days <laughs> and i was so excited I was like, oh my God, what if in like a few days I could read and drive? That would be incredible. Didn't come to pass, as you can tell. Uh, but um, he was like, if that doesn't work, we just keep upping the dosage until we get to the maximum dosage or you have side effects or it's fixed. Um, and then there are like a few other drugs we can try. So I just got permission from my doctor today to up my dosage and she's now happy for me to up it like weekly until we reach that point. So that's good. Yeah, so no actual improvement <laughs> in this direction um but i feel like i'm talking to the right people we've got plans things are happening and that's good the thing with the mri a uh, bit tricky not sure if i've ever mentioned this on youtube i have magnets in my fingers well i currently only have one magnet in my finger because this one got removed I, I, you, can you see that that's like gray and gross yeah back alley surgery not pleasant anyway um MRIs, magnets, not big fans of each other or very big fans of each other, depending which way they're facing. So uh, I know that people have had MRIs with magnets in their fingers. Oh, I'll leave a link below with what that's all about. I made a little website about it. Uh, anyway, people have had my MRIs with magnets in their fingers and been fine, but I'm basically trying to convince the MRI people that that's safe. And it's currently with the Trust's MRI safety expert and they need to sign off on it. If they say no, then I have to have this magnet removed from my hand. Didn't foresee this when I got magnets put in my fingers when I was 23. Um, but you know, that's, <laughs> that's life. Um, hopefully I can have, I can be referred to the plastics department by this neurologist and hopefully that will make it go a bit quicker. And then maybe even I could get them to clean up this one because it's still a bit of a mess. Um, it'd be nice to have an actual surgeon taking out my magnets this time. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's that with MRIs. That's that with the medical things. Now we're going to move on to another topic, work and money. Um, so as I said, I can do some computer work. Um, I'm actually just going to pause and redo this lighting. It's getting, the sun is setting early these days and I didn't start early enough 
um, to have the light all day. So we're just gonna brighten ourselves up, just a sec. Okay, um, so yes, I can do computer work now, which is wonderful, um, but what I can do, I can do some coding, but I can only really code my own stuff, stuff I'm familiar with. But all the normal things that my job would comprise of, um, like Zooms, I can't handle multiple faces, no thank you, uh, context switching, research, uh, I just can't do any of that. So I can sort of do some of my own work, but I, can't, I just can't do all the things that would make up my actual job. Um, uh, beyond that, I'm wildly inconsistent with when I can work and how much I can work. Like one day I might be able to work like 10 hours on my laptop and then I'll have a whole week of being like unable to pick up my laptop at all. Um, so I'm just not capable of working at all at the moment. Um, so as I mentioned in my last video, I work for a US based tech company called GitHub. Um, in my last video, I had just finished the sick leave 12 weeks and was transitioning onto the medical leave indefinite, for which I was claiming on income protection insurance. That insurance would give me 75% of my base salary, which is like fine, enough to live off, thank you. Um, but that insurance still hasn't come through. I don't see myself going back to work for a while. Uh, just, I mean, you've watched this video. <laughs> Do I seem like someone that could work consistently? Um, uh, so if my insurance claim it is rejected, I'm just gonna have to deal with it. I can't force myself back into work, I don't want to. Um, but on the upside, the work that I've been doing myself on my computer, I feel like I use the term work when I mean anything towards a goal. So when I say I've been working on my computer, I haven't been doing company work. I've been doing Charlotte's little projects work. Um, and I've been working on this art project and it's going to be launched in the new year on this platform. This isn't really the place to explain that, but basically I should be making some money from that, um, which is good. And if none of the drugs work and I'm just, this is my life, hopefully I can make a living out of selling like art and making art myself. And then I can do that really in whatever time scale works for me. Um, it'd be a shame because I think collaboration, I, do, I need collaboration to be happy really, but uh, I can't do that now. So that's life. Another bit of related news is that I finally applied for PIP, which is something I've been putting off for months and months. Uh, PIP stands for personal independence payments. <coughs> um, very spitty type of benefit. Uh, it is basically like disability benefit, but it's not based on your disability. It's based on how your disability impacts your ability to perform everyday tasks, such as feeding yourself, bathing yourself, getting from place to place. Um, so that's, it applies to mental health conditions as well as physical impairments. And I sh applied two weeks ago. Um, it's quite a long process, but I think I, think I should, get it based on all of the symptoms I have. There's like the daily living and then there's a mobility and there's like a standard rate and then there's higher rate for each of them. So if you get all of them, I think it adds up to about 120 pounds a week, something like that, maybe a bit more. So 600 pounds a month, potentially. The thing I'm more excited about for it, because when I started thinking about it, I like, didn't need the money, um, which is a very arrogant thing to say, um, but it's more like I didn't, I wasn't like relying on that income, even though like I may need to. Um, but then a friend of mine who does these sort of applications quite a lot, um, she was like, think of it more as like a rebate on how much more expensive your life is because of your disability. And I was like, oh my God, how much I spend on takeout and taxis? I mean, probably not 600 pounds a month, but it's, uh, it's not zero, I'll put it that way. The thing I really want for it is that I would love to have a blue badge, um, which is a disability badge in your car, which means you can park in lots of different places. Um, again, I'm not driving, but I get driven around a lot and it would just be so much easier. Like for example, at the beach, being able to park like right next to the entrance to things rather than far away. And you know, Brian just drops me off at the place and then he goes and parks and stuff. Um, but oh gosh, it would make my life so much more convenient and I think I'm entitled to it at this point. Anyway, so that's it. That's where my life is at. That's where my body's at. Um, 
sounds quite sad, doesn't it? Um, even though, like, day to day, my life is good. I've got cute dog, cute boyfriend, cute house, um, cute Christmas tree. And I do get to basically do what I want to do. I mean, within my physical abilities. I get to just sit around all day and I have lots of choice and that's lovely. Um, but my life is so different to what it was. And it's hard to adjust now from thinking this might be months to thinking this might be years, um, which is scary. On the upside, I have a new sense of gratitude. <laughs> you can't be grateful for things that you already have. Uh, so losing aspects of my health makes me very, very thankful for other aspects of my health. And hopefully one day when I can run again, oh, I, dr I literally dream about running like every single night. Um, I cannot wait to get back running. And I used to like running, but oh my God, I will love running when I'm allowed to run again. <laughs> um, so yeah, looking forward to things like that and just being like, wow, my brain works. That's so cool. My tummy, like I can eat whatever and it's fine, it handles it, you know? Like don't have any digestional <laughs> issues. Um, so it's nice just being like, wow, Bonnie, you're really acing it in like some ways. <laughs> <laughs> I have really good skin. Thanks, body. Um, okay, right. There we go. I don't know who this is for. Is it just solidarity with other people that are going through this bullshit? I hope my life is worse than yours, because if your life is worse than mine, or if your health is worse than mine, my life is good. But if your health is worse than mine, I really feel for you. And I'm really sorry. And I hope it gets better soon. Uh, even if it doesn't get better soon, you get better at handling it over time. And I truly believe that because I'm definitely experiencing that. I'm just gonna go get the dog because he needs to sign off. Thank you from me, Adam Huxley. <laughs> Goodbye. <sighs>